many years and have been mispronouncing her last name the entire time. Um, and so for all of you, it is Rudinger, not Rudinger. Um, so who did her PhD at, at JHU and then um, spent a year in Seattle um, uh, and has basically worked on everything that I consider sort of core to all of like NLP. Um, and so it makes me feel very much not an NLP person. Um, so whether that's NLU type problems for understanding, whether that's common sense reasoning problems, whether that's the, the, the sort of biases and effects that come from using those types of models. And so it is kind of exciting to have her here and, I mean, not kind of, it is, um, exciting to have her here and to talk about what she's been up to since being at UMD um, because it means that I now get a quick look at where our field has been moving. And so with that, Rachel. <laughs> Thanks very much, Yonatan, for this. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. Um, it's great to be here. I'm very happy to be talking to you all uh, today. Um, just wanted to know if you want to ask questions during the talk. That's totally fine. I'm happy to take them. Uh, so the title of my talk is Not So Fast, Revisiting Assumptions in and About Natural Language Reasoning. Um, by the way, is, is my audio good? Can everybody hear me OK? OK, great. Um, so I'm going to start with the question of what do we mean by reasoning in natural language? And so what I mean by this is we can have a description of a context, of a situation um, described in natural language, and we want to be able to make inferences about that situation um, also expressed through natural language. So we can have a context like somebody dropped a glass on the floor, and our inference is the glass shattered. And there's many different ways that we can um, formulate a task to um, categorize these kinds of inferences. So in the task of natural language inference, this, inf um, this inference that the glass shattered would be um, labeled with one of three possible categorical labels, entailment, neutral, or contradiction. Um, in this case, because the glass shattering is not something that's guaranteed to be true, it's possible but not guaranteed, um, we would label this as neutral. Um, we can also have a, a relaxation of those three categories and try to be a little bit more specific about the um, degree of likelihood of that inference. So we could attempt to apply a scalar label to the glass shattering to um, impart sort of a sense of confidence in how likely that is to be the case. Or we could apply an ordinal label um, such as uh, impossible, unlikely, plausible, or likely um, to, uh, to that inference to you know, indicate how, how certain we are that this um, neutral inference is you know, likely to be true or not. And then finally, we can also um, take a generative approach to reasoning in natural language. So given a, a contextual description of a situation, like somebody dropped a glass, rather than taking an inference and applying a label to it, we can just automatically generate inferences that are likely or plausible to be true, such as, um, as a result, others feel annoyed, or the person then gets yelled at, um, things like that. So that's kind of the general backdrop for this talk. I'm going to be talking about um, ta reasoning in natural language and certain assumptions that we have about reasoning systems and certain kinds of assumptions that these reasoning systems themselves make. So to give a, uh, an outline of the talk, there's going to be three components to the talk. So first, I will talk about overriding assumptions in natural language reasoning systems with defeasible inference. So the idea here is that we have our context inference pair. Um, and so you know, the glass shattered is a possible but not guaranteed in, uh, inference. Um, and we want to know how we should um, sort of reassess that inference in light of new information that might make it less likely to be true or more likely to be true. So what if subsequently we learned that um, the glass was dropped on a floor with uh, carpeting? Um, how does that affect our, the strength of, our, um, uh, of that inference? Um, secondly, uh, in the second part of the talk, I'm going to discuss some work on um, revisiting um, assumptions that we as researchers have made about the results from partial input baseline experiments. So there have been some experiments, um, including some that I've been involved in, showing that uh, when we take natural language reasoning systems and we try to you know, make, predict what the correct entailment label is based only on the inference, ignoring the context, um, these systems can do better than random. And uh, that means that they could be potentially ignoring context and not actually doing the kinds of reasoning tasks that we, we want them to be doing. 
Um, so just because it's possible that they could be ignoring context, does that mean that they actually ignore context? That's going to be the second part of the talk. And the third part of the talk, I will discuss some work on um, harmful assumptions that these models make in turn about people, um, in particular in the form of social stereotyping. So how does social identity influence the kind of inferences that these systems make about individual people? Okay, so with that, I'm going to jump into part one on defeasible inference. And so what is defeasible inference? I'll start off with a very canonical example of uh, defeasible reasoning. So we have a premise, Harold is a bird, and our inference, therefore, Harold flies. And it turns out that subsequently we might learn that Harold is a penguin, and so we have to revise that inference and conclude that, therefore, Harold does not actually fly. So what does defeasible mean? Um, this word means uh, capable of being annulled or made void. So when we see the word defeasible, um, we should think of the word defeat, as in to defeat an argument. And I'm going to argue here that defeasible reasoning is ubiquitous across different kinds of domains. So in scientific reasoning, um, we have this nice quote from Armstrong 1983, the laws of nature are oaken, not iron. So we have these generalizations that often come with exceptions. So mammals give live birth, except monotremes. These are um, animals like echidnas and platypuses, which are mammals, but they lay eggs instead of giving live birth. Um, we all knew, know Newton's laws, um, force equals mass times acceleration, but this is less likely to be true when we're talking about systems that are moving at relativistic speeds. So there's all of these exceptions in scientific reasoning. Um, physical common sense, we want systems to be able to reason about the physical world around them. So we have generalizations like if you drop uh, a glass object, um, it will likely break when it lands, but there are exceptions to that kind of reasoning, so not if it lands on a, a pile of soft clothing. Um, what surfaces are slippery to walk on, but less so if you're wearing rubber-soled shoes. So we need to be able to reason about exceptions to um, physical common sense reasoning as well. And then in the case of social common sense, where we want to reason about situations involving people and uh, motivations and social norms, um, this is a, a domain in which the kinds of you know, social norms and rules that we need to reason about um, are rife with exceptions. So in some cultures, it's customary to shake hands as a greeting. But as we've learned in the past couple of years, this may be much less so the case during a global pandemic. Um, it's rude to not show up to a wedding you attend, agreed to attend. But maybe it's socially acceptable if you have to miss it due to illness. Um, in the realm of legal reasoning, uh, most laws have some kind of exception. Um, sometimes these are intentional or sometimes they're unintentional in the form of loopholes. Um, the applicability of laws may depend on context. Um, so most legal codes around the, uh, around the world have you know, uh, provisions that it's illegal to kill another human, um, but many of them will also incorporate exceptions in the case of um, self-defense. So if we want systems to be able to perform um, you know, legal reasoning, they also need to be in, able to engage in defeasible inference. So I'm making the case here that defeasible, the ability to engage in defeasible inference is broadly applicable across many different domains. Okay, so now let's turn to uh, the, the uh, task that we're uh, looking at. So most natural language inference data sets or most uh, natural language reasoning data sets are of the form, uh, we have some kind of contextual uh, description of a situation paired with an inference. But this is kind of a one-off inference. So we just have the context and the inference, um, and we have to decide how likely that inference is to be true given the context. Um, but what if we augmented these, uh, these examples with um, information that would make that inference more or less likely to be true. So with this dropping a glass example, we would be much less likely to infer that the glass shattered if we were to subsequently learn that it fell onto a pile of laundry, it was dropped only an inch from the ground, it's made of durable glass, the situation is taking place on the moon, and so on and so forth. And similarly, we would be you know, more likely to infer that the inference is true if we were to learn that the glass is made of a thin material, um, it's dropped from really high up, it landed on something that's very uh, firm, it already had some imperfections, and so on and so forth. And so this idea of augmenting these um, context inference pairs with additional information that makes us more or less likely to, um, you know, that, that modulates the strength of inference is exactly what we're looking at here in this defeasible NLI task. And so this is work that I did uh, back at AI2 um, and the University of Washington. 
Um, so we're going to define this defeasible natural language inference uh, task. So we're going to define this in a way that's very similar to the task formulations for recognizing textual entailment or natural language inference. We're going to say, given a premise P, we'll say that a hypothesis H is defeasible if there exists some update sentence U that's consistent with P, such that a human would find H less likely to be true after learning U. So there's two types of update sentences. It can be a weakener or a strengthener. So we'll call an update a, a weakener if a human would most likely find H less likely to be true after learning U, and if instead they would be more likely, if they would find H more likely to be true, then we'll call U a strengthener. And so we're going to develop this defeasible NLI data set, we'll call it Delta NLI, and we're just going to build right on top of existing natural language inference or common sense reasoning data sets that have this sort of context inference pair set up. So we're going to um, augment the Stanford natural language uh, inference data set. We're going to uh, augment the atomic common sense inference data set, as well as a data set for social common sense called social chemistry. Um, and so the augmented uh, version of each of these data sets will be delta SNLI, delta atomic, and delta social, respectively. And so we're just going to um, augment the inferences with uh, updates that make those sentences that make those inferences more or less likely to be true. So our annotation protocol is we will present a crowdsource worker with a context inference pair and ask them to write um, a weakener and a strengthener. So one sentence that makes the inference less likely to be true, one that makes it more likely to be true. So we collect about 100,000 um, weakeners and strengtheners total for SNLI and, social, and the social chemistry data set and about 50,000 for atomic. And we've got a roughly 50-50 even split between strengtheners and weakeners. Not perfect because we did some validation, so uh, not all instances made it through validation. So to give a few concrete examples of what this looks like, um, the defeasible SNLI or delta SNLI portion of the data set we start with an original uh, example from the SNLI data set. So the premise, two men and a dog are standing among rolling green hills. Our hypothesis is the men are farmers. This is a neutral hypothesis. It's, it's possible, but it's not guaranteed to be true. And we're only going to augment neutral hypotheses in, um, the, in the SNLI case, because if the inference is entailed or contradicted, then it's already guaranteed to be true or guaranteed to be false. And there's really not much we can do to modulate the strength of inference by adding new information without introducing a contradiction. Okay, so the weakener that the annotator wrote in this case is the two men are wearing hiking backpacks. So this would tend to lend credence to the idea that the two men in the scenario are uh, travelers rather than uh, farmers. And the strengthener is the dog is a sheep dog, which kind of um, lends credence to the idea that this is a sort of pastoral setting. Uh, the second data set that we're going to um, augment is uh, the atomic data set, which, is, um, which contains pairs of contexts and inferences um, in this sort of if-then reasoning um, style uh, across many different uh, branches of reasoning. So as an example, we'll have a context like person X is sprayed by a skunk, and then we have um, a bunch of different kinds of inferences about you know, what happens as a result, um, how do people feel as a result, what happened before, and so on and so forth. So in order to augment these, we're going to draw a premise hypothesis pair, what we'll you know, call the, the pH pair, based on the original uh, situation, that's our premise, and then we'll just take one single branch from this um, tree and we'll call that the hypothesis. So person X is sprayed by a skunk, as a result, person X feels smelly, that's the hypothesis. And the weakener that the annotator wrote in this case is person X is wearing a protective smock. And the strengthener is many people are pinching their noses around person X. And finally, for uh, defeasible social rules, this is the social chemistry data set that we're augmenting. Um, this data set doesn't exactly have premise hypothesis pairs, but it has sort of um, generalized if-then reasoning about social situations in the form of social rules. So an example is, it's OK if you don't like the food someone gives you and you don't want to eat it. And so um, the annotators will write weakeners and strengtheners that make, you know, that give um, situations in which that's, that rule is especially applicable and situations where it's especially not applicable. So um, it's less likely, it, the rule is less likely to hold if you told them you would try some um, and uh, 
it's especially uh, going to hold if you're allergic to the food. You especially don't have to eat it if you're allergic. Okay, so we formulated a binary classification task out of uh, this data set. Um, and so uh, here a random baseline would perform at about 50%. Um, the human baselines are um, all over, you know, somewhere around 80%. Um, and we looked at different kinds of um, Roberta-based partial input and full input baselines here. And so what we find is that um, if we remove the premise, if we, um, if we classify on the basis of the premise hypothesis and update the full input, we get performance that's pretty close to um, human performance. If we remove uh, the premise, um, so that's the green bars, then the performance only drops a very tiny bit. So it turns out the, the premises aren't that important to classification. And one of the reasons, one of the intuitions behind this is if we think back to that penguin example, um, it turns out that the update uh, that um, Harold is a penguin actually entailed the original premise. So you didn't even need to know the premise at all to do the inference in that particular case. So there might be some cases where you know, the premise is, is not entirely necessary to do the reasoning, that the, the more germane part is the hypothesis and the update. And we find that when we remove the hypothesis and try to predict on the basis of the update alone, we're doing better than random. So there are artifacts involved um, or, or priors, um, but on the other hand, um, the hypothesis is still very important to being able to do the reasoning task. Okay, so rather than focus on, um, you know, sort of trying to make that a very uh, a more challenging classification task, we think about how to use that data to um, create generative defeasible reasoning models. So given a premise and a hypothesis, can you actually generate updates that act as strengtheners or weakeners for the hypothesis? And so um, with a trained GPT, a fine-tuned GPT-based uh, model, um, we have um, uh, some, some examples here of, of the kinds of strengtheners and weakeners that those models are capable of producing. So um, for SNLI, if our premise hypothesis pair is a surfer is riding the waves while another surfer sits on his board waiting, and the hypothesis is there are people surfing in a competition, the strengtheners that the model generates are uh, the people are wearing numbered bibs, there are judges watching the surfers, and both of these tend to, uh, would be updates that would tend to strengthen that inference that it's a competition. Um, and conversely, the generated weakeners are the surfer on the board looks bored, the surfer on the board is a beginner. Um, for the social chemistry, you know, we have, a, we have a rule, it's wrong to ditch your friends, and the generated strengtheners are they need your help, they are stranded in the middle of nowhere, the weakeners are they are taking advantage of you, you have to go to the hospital, um, and so forth. And so we did um, a human evaluation of these generated strengtheners and weakeners, and we find that um, overall, uh, the best models uh, do a fairly good job at generating valid strengtheners and weakeners. Um, note here that because this is a generative task, the baseline is no longer 50%. It's probably closer to, uh, a completely uninformed baseline would probably be closer to 0% here. Um, so these models are doing a reasonably good job, um, but not quite at human level. Um, and in general, some observations about the generated strengtheners and weakeners is that they're topical and fluent. We are able to produce many effective strengtheners and weakeners, which is hard to do accidentally. Um, sometimes, on the other hand, we find that the strengtheners and weakeners are actually swapped. Um, so the models aren't fully capable of conditioning on, on what's the correct label. Um, some weakeners uh, contradict the premise we observe sometimes, and that's a violation of the task formulation. Um, sometimes we notice that the strengtheners um, can either presuppose or reiterate the hypothesis, which is also not um, supposed to be the case. And then there are some broader, more open-ended questions about this. Um, so, you know, one behavior that we observed is this kind of defaulting or back off to broad purpose weakeners. So in the case of social inference, um, the social rules are often less likely to apply um, if you know, a person is being mean or in, in some other way violating social norms already, then it, that makes it more possible for uh, you, know, you yourself to, to in turn violate social norms. But that isn't really necessarily specific to a particular situation. It's kind of a, a broader fact about uh, social norms. And finally, um, there's a, a broad question of um, 
what's the recall here? How, how well are systems able to actually you know, find all of the strengtheners or weakeners? And that would be a very, that's a, that's a challenging question to answer. Um, and so that's kind of a, an open question, I think, for, for future research here. So one thing um, is that we saw there are, um, some, there are some artifacts present in this data. We saw that the uh, partial input baselines um, outperform a random baseline. Um, and so that might raise doubts about the ability to learn to do defeasible reasoning from this data set. Um, but clearly, the generative models have learned something. They're, they're doing something valuable here. They're, they're creating strengtheners and weakeners. Um, and so how do we reconcile these two views? You know, on the one hand, maybe we have a data set that has artifacts. Does it mean that a, a model is not capable of learning uh, defeasible reasoning from it? On the other hand, we show that uh, generative models are capable of doing some form of defeasible reasoning. And so how do we reconcile these two? And that's the topic for part two of this talk, where we're going to revisit some assumptions about partial input baselines. And so this is work by my PhD student at University of Maryland, Neha Shrikant. Um, so the background here is that, um, again, in the task of natural language inference, um, this is defined as, would a human reading the premise infer that the hypothesis is true, given that the premise is true? And one observation about this task is that if we're actually doing reasoning, then the system should be using both the premise and hypothesis to answer that question. Um, the answer shouldn't depend only on the hypothesis. Okay, but as it turned out, um, there are a couple papers that came out um, in 2018, one of which I was involved in, um, demonstrating that if you occlude or cover up uh, the premise um, in a system, and train it just to predict the entailment labels from the hypothesis alone, um, you can pretty well outperform a random baseline. And so this um, tells us that there are some statistical artifacts present in the hypothesis that allows the model to you know, try to figure out or, or determine at a rate better than random um, what the correct label is. Um, and so this you know, sort of calls into question what, what kinds of reasoning the models are actually doing. Okay, so there's a couple conclusions that we could draw from these um, hypothesis-only discoveries. So one conclusion is hypothesis-only baselines are learning to leverage data set artifacts that hint at the correct answer and are thus able to make correct predictions without actually doing reasoning. Um, a second conclusion that we could potentially draw here is that, therefore, a full input model uh, trained on the same data set but now that now has access to the premise and the hypothesis is doing the same thing. It's, it's exploiting those artifacts, and it's doing well at the task because of those artifacts that are present, and it's not actually doing real reasoning. And this is a bad thing. This is not what we want reasoning systems to, to be doing. Um, but now we're going to focus in on this second conclusion, ask, is this actually a valid conclusion? Um, is this, do, does the set of experiments that we've seen here actually support this conclusion? And I'm going to argue that it doesn't. Um, by analogy to a math test. So imagine for a second that you have a student that is studying for a math test and you give them a bunch of practice problems, but you've removed the actual problem from the test and you just have the multiple choice answers. And by studying the, this test with the questions removed, the student is able to sort of identify some biases in how the test was created. Answer C is you know, a little bit more, more likely than 25% chance to be the right answer. Um, odd numbers have a higher chance of being a right answer than a wrong answer, and so forth. So it can, you know, they, the student can kind of um, infer things based on the structure of the answer alone that allows it, um, that allows the student to, you know, achieve 65% uh, on the test um, when they go ahead and take the test that doesn't include the questions. Uh, on the other hand, we have a second student who is going to get a set of tests to study from that include the questions. And as it turns out, you know, maybe the student notices these, um, these biases. You know, maybe the student notices that answer C is slightly more likely to be the right answer than answer B. Um, but it turns out that the most reliable way for the student to actually get the right answer is to just do the math problem. And so this student goes ahead and takes the math test and gets 92%. And they do that by actually doing the math problem rather than relying on these sort of weaker signals 
um, in, in the structure of the answers. So this, this is related to our central question that we're going to ask here, which is, do full input natural language inference models learn to condition on the premise despite being trained on data sets that contain artifacts? So what are the full input models actually doing? Are they ignoring the context or are they learning to leverage it in some sort of useful way? And so um, our central question is, do NLI models learn to condition on context in general um, despite being trained on data sets that contain artifacts. Um, and so we're going to look at two data sets here. We're going to look at the original SNLI data set, and we're also going to look at delta SNLI, um, which we just described in uh, the previous uh, section of the talk. Um, and so I'm just going to introduce some uh, language here to sort of generalize between these two data sets. Um, we have something called a target. So in the case of SNLI, that's the hypothesis. In the case of Delta SNLI, that's, um, that's the update sentence. And the context is everything else. So for SNLI, the context is the premise. For uh, Delta SNLI, the context is the premise and the hypothesis together. Um, so for a partial input baseline, we're going to feed into the system only the target. And for the full input system, we'll feed in the context and the target, everything. OK, and so one thing, a couple things to note here. Um, Conditioning on context would not be a sufficient condition to conclude that models are reasoning. So if we can prove that the models are using the context, that's not necessarily a sufficient condition for us to conclude that the models are actually doing reasoning, but it is a sufficient condition for us to invalidate that second conclusion that we were talking about. It's, it's enough for us to reject the conclusion from the original hypothesis only work, um, the conclusions that people have drawn about hypothesis only models that therefore full input baselines um, are ignoring context or not doing real reasoning. Okay, so we're going to investigate the role of context in NLI models through two sets of experiments. Um, the first experiment um, is uh, involving the usage of context in NLI. So we're going to ask, does access to context strengthen a full input model's confidence in the right answer compared to the partial input model? And the answer is yes. We do find that full input models are uh, more confident in what the correct label is than the corresponding uh, partial input model. And the second experiment, we're going to actually edit contexts in order to flip the label. And we're going to see that if we edit the context, um, in, in examples where we know the hypothesis contains or that the target contains artifacts, um, is the model able to flip the label uh, in light of that editing or does the, does the present artifact, um, you know, does it become overly reliant on the artifact in such a way that it is not then able to flip the, uh, the predicted label? And the answer is also yes, full input models are in fact sensitive to context modifications and able to flip their label um, despite the presence of artifacts. Okay, so context, uh, so experiment one, context in NLI. Um, access to context strengthens a full, model, a full input model's confidence in the correct label compared to partial input model's confidences. This is, this is what our finding is. And so uh, this plot shows on the x-axis the confidence that a partial input model has on the correct label. And on the y-axis, for the, same, for the same problem shows the full input model's confidence in the correct label. And so this um, dotted red line here is the y equals x line. This is where the confidences would be identical between partial input and full input. And so anything above this dotted line is an example where the full input model was more confident in the correct answer than the partial input model. And what we find is that the, in the overwhelming majority of cases, the confidence in the right answer increased. Um, similarly, for the delta NLI task, um, we have, you know, again, the same setup here. The x-axis shows the confidence in the right label. The y-axis, uh, for a partial input model, y-axis is confidence in right label for a full input model. And again, the majority of the mass is above that um, y equals x line. And you can also see the shift in confidences um, on these marginal distributions. Okay, so that showed us that the model is effectively leveraging context because 
when the context is present, the model becomes more confident in the right label. The second experiment is context editing. So we're asking our full input model sensitive to context modifications that result in a flipped label. So we have a premise hypothesis pair where uh, we have reason to believe that an artifact is present in the hypothesis. And then we're going to edit the premise um, in such a way that the correct label is now flipped. And so we want to know, will a model um, be able to get the correct, cor um, correctly predict the right label for this edited example? Um, and if it's becoming overly reliant upon artifacts, if it's only relying on artifacts, then it shouldn't be able to flip its label. And so what we find here, um, this is um, the results on, you know, broken down by what's the original label versus what's the new label after editing. Um, this is the accuracy for each of those bins. And we find that for most, in, in most cases, the, accu the accuracy is 70% or higher. Um, for both SNLI and Delta NLI. Um, there's one notable exception here, which is this bin um, where the original example was a neutral example and the example is edited to become an entailed example. So this might be a case where the models are in fact actually becoming overly reliant on, on artifacts. But in general, they are showing a great capability of, of flipping the label. And you might also wonder, you know, is it possible that what we've done here is actually by editing, you know, we, we made really easy examples. So actually these edited examples are, are just easier than the original data examples. Um, and we ran some uh, very uh, um, basic lexical baselines on these models and show that they're just as difficult as the original examples. Okay, so some key takeaways from this work. Um, first of all, it is hasty to conclude that models trained on data sets with artifacts are not capable of reasoning, um, even though high scoring partial input baselines show that a full input model could be ignoring context and still performing well. Um, these experiments are showing that they don't actually do that. Um, these models are still capable of leveraging the context quite effectively when it's present. Um, secondly, um, artifacts can and do lead to models with exploitable heuristics. Um, but artifacts don't necessarily spell disaster for a model's reasoning capabilities. There are still cases where the model is capable of leveraging context. Third, NLI models can and do meet one of the necessary conditions for reasoning, that is leveraging the full input. Um, as we said, this isn't a sufficient condition, but it is inherently necessary, and we've shown that it's satisfied. Um, and fourth, partial input baselines should be understood as a warning sign. They're sufficient to conclude that full input models might not be leveraging critical context, but insufficient to prove that they don't. Um, so it might be the case that if artifacts are present, a model is ignoring context, um, but we can't necessarily uh, conclude that that's the case. Okay, so moving on to the third part. Before I move on, are there any questions about either the first or the second part? Yeah, um, so, so this is, I think that um, ultimately the degree of sensitivity to artifacts will depend on how useful the artifact is. So if it's just kind of a weak statistical signal, which it is seemingly the case in um, you know, SNLI that you know, there are some um, statistical correlations, um, that the model will still choose to leverage the context if it's, if it's a more useful signal. But you could certainly imagine running ex an experiment where you know, if you just inserted the correct label into the hypothesis, um, you, you just you know, have um, a token that is 100% predictive of what the right label is, um, you have, there, there should not be any reason why that model would learn to leverage context in that case, because the, the artifact is so reliable, it doesn't need to learn anything else. So it depends kind of, I think, on sort of how reliable and how strong the artifact is. 
Yeah. Um, so basically, um, a an example would be if we use a sort of impoverished uh, model, like a, a, a bag of words model, um, uh, on the full input, um, that can give us a sense as to how difficult the example is and, and how, um, uh, how likely there are sort of you know, shallow lexical artifacts um, that allow the model to, to predict the correct answer. And so what we find, you know, we, we run sort of this, um, like a bag of words baseline on both the original examples and the edited examples. Um, and if, if we had made the edited examples much, much easier, we would expect to see much higher performance on a bag of words baseline, um, but we don't find that to be the case. Yeah. Okay, great. So I will move on to the third part, which is about um, harmful model assumptions, um, in particular social stereotyping. So we're asking how does social identity influence um, common sense reasoning in natural language? So I'm actually going to, if I have time, talk about two pieces of work here. Um, the first is uh, with um, students at the University of Maryland, Trista Sao and uh, Anna Sotnikova, and my colleague, Hal Dome. And so in this work, we are looking at stereotyping in generative inference tasks. So the task here is, given a premise, we want a, a model to uh, generate a hypothesis that is plausible or likely to be true. And so we're going to fine tune in this work a GPT-2 model on uh, the data sets SNLI, MNLI, and Atomic. And then what we're going to do is create a bunch of templated input premises. And all of these input premises are of the form um, a, uh, a person does, is involved in some situation. And we're going to specify the identity of the person. We're going to specify the situation that they're involved in. And then we're just going to run through all of the possible combinations of identity situation pairs. So we'll have sentences like a French person, uh, goes to a doctor, um, a rich person is shopping, etc. So we'll have all, all of the pairwise combinations. Um, and so we're selecting identities, uh, terms that, that designate identities based on uh, gender, race, nationality, religion, um, political stance, and uh, socioeconomic uh, class. And so what we find is, um, in practice, a lot of the generated inferences qualitatively appear to um, strongly reinforce stereotypes about groups. So if the premise is a person makes money, where we insert different kinds of um, identities for that person, um, we find that the generated hypothesis is highly sensitive to the identity of the person. So um, a poor person makes money, the generated hypothesis is a poor person makes money by selling drugs. This is a very um, harmful stereotype about uh, poor people and drug usage. Um, uh, on the other hand, um, uh, a Jewish person makes money. The hypothesis is Jewish people make money because they have a lot of money. This is also a very um, harmful stereotype about Jewish people. And so we see lots of um, stereotypes about individuals based on their identity cropping up in these generated hypotheses, um, in large part because these are somewhat underspecified uh, premises. And so the, the model is just kind of left to imagine why that might be the case. So what we do is um, we manually annotate uh, these generated hypotheses to kind of get a sense at an aggregate level of what's going on here. Um, so we first ask, is the hypothesis plausible? Um, is the hypothesis based on the person's identity? Or is the hypothesis based on the situation? So they can answer yes or no for either of those. Um, does the hypothesis express positive or negative sentiment towards the person? Um, does the hypothesis invoke a known stereotype? And uh, if so, uh, describe the, um, the stereotype. And one thing that's interesting here is that it's very difficult um, to get agreement on um, this question five, does the hypothesis invoke a known stereotype? Um, people have different kinds of ideas of, of you know, what social stereotypes exist. Um, it might be sort of uh, culturally contextual. And also, there's not a high degree of agreement on whether or not a particular inference invokes that particular stereotype. But what we do get higher agreement on is when we annotate on the question of whether or not the inference is based on the person's identity and is the inference based on the situation. So that's a little bit 
removed from the question of is it a specific stereotype, just is it based on the identity or is it based on the situation? And so one of the things that we find is that inferences there are some classes of inferences that are based on identity alone. So these are the examples where annotators said the, um, the inference is based on the person's identity but not based on the situation. And we find that there's actually a sort of widely ranging degree to which um, different identities result in inferences based on identity alone. So um, formerly incarcerated Asian, Jewish, Democrat, Irish, and homeless are the categories that we found had the highest rate of generating inferences um, based on identity alone, um, whereas uh, certain other categories, um, in particular gender, um, seemed less likely to result in those, those kinds of inferences. So I want to raise an interesting uh, a question here um, as about whether or not it might be possible to reformulate or think about stereotypes as a form of defeasible inference, that these are um, soft inferences that a model makes that could potentially be overridden with new information. So if we had systems that were capable of performing defeasible inference um, and we were to update them with information that would help override the stereotyped inference, is that one way that we could potentially get um, reasoning systems to overcome these stereotyped inferences. So could we get a model to um, be less likely to make this harmful inference about a poor person selling drugs by updating it with information like the person earns money at a job, the person is not a criminal, the person pays income taxes, and so forth. So this is kind of a speculative uh, thought here. Um, and so if I have time, I'm going to talk just a little bit about um, one final piece of work re regarding um, social biases in common sense reasoning. And so this is work by my PhD student, Hao Jia'an, um, another undergrad at University of Maryland, Zhong Xiaoli, and our collaborator, Jia Yu Zhao. Okay. Um, before I move on, are there any other questions? Oh, yeah. Please. I had a feeling that somehow, uh, in the context, it makes me feel more like, okay, I can see that these are stereotypes. Right. But without context, I didn't mean seeing the other examples. Yeah. Uh, I am not sure how confident I would be saying, okay, a uh, woman who makes uh, earns money feels lucky. Right, right. 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 Yeah, that's a great point that some of these, you know, the, the degree to which stereotyping is happening may be sort of relative to what the behavior is with respect to other groups. And that's exactly what I'm going to talk about sort of in, in this. Uh, it, well, it, it's related to, <laughs> yeah, great segue, related to what I, the work I'm about to talk about. Um, but uh, I, I think that that kind of goes two ways because um, you know, a fair behavior of a model um, where it's you know, creating the same inference for every single group might in isolation still look unfair if the inference uh, reinforces a stereotype about a particular group, even if it has that same inference for all the other groups, um, one is not necessarily seeing the behavior, uh, you know, the counterfactual behavior for all the other groups to say, oh, actually it is, you know, treating all these groups the same way, um, because, you know, in sort of a downstream task, you might only see the behavior once. Um, but similarly, you know, the, the opposite might be true, where you might not suspect anything until you go and look at the counterfactual cases with all the other groups, and you see, oh, wait, actually, this is very different behavior. Yeah. So that's, that's a great point, that like, you know, our perception here may depend a little bit on what the comparison is across other groups. Yeah. How much is the identity of the annotators matter in terms of all the agreements? Yes. Um, so in this case, um, so all of the authors did the annotation here, um, and so in some cases, you know, we, we um, yeah, the authors ha all have, you know, different sort of um, uh, cultural backgrounds, um, but in other ways are similar, you know, all computer scientists. So um, we have actually a, a follow-up study where we, I, I don't have it in this talk, but um, we ask uh, people for their perceptions of U.S. stereotypes um, about different groups um, and we also um, collect uh, information about 
the individuals themselves. And we do find that um, the responses are very different based on the uh, groups that, that people belong to. Yeah. OK, so in this work, um, the second piece of work that I'm going to talk about, um, this has to do with social common sense reasoning. We're going to be analyzing the behavior of social common sense reasoning models. So as I sort of briefly mentioned before, social common sense reasoning is the task of reasoning about social situations, any kind of situation involving people, um, psychological motivations, uh, social norms, what kinds of actions people are likely to take in certain scenarios. So basically reasoning about any situation involving people. And so we're going to focus on the social IQA data set um, by uh, Martin Zapp, who, you're all, uh, who you all know. Um, and the social IQA data set um, consists of descriptions, uh, a contextual description of a situation, um, followed by a question uh, with multiple choice answers. So uh, an example is Alex spilled the food she just prepared all over the floor and it made a huge mess. What will Alex want to do next? Um, and the correct answer in this case is mop up. Um, and so there's you know, different kinds of questions that we can ask about people involved in these situations. And um, we want to know whether um, if you, we modulate or if we manipulate the identity or the perceived identity of the person involved in the situation, will that result in uh, the model answering the question differently. And so we're going to start with an observation here that uh, contextualized language models represent names that have different demographic attributes differently and in ways that make the demographic attributes recoverable from the representation. So there have been a number of um, studies, both in NLP and in the social sciences, showing that um, both humans and models um, may treat uh, individuals differently based on their name. So there's famous um, resume studies. You know, you send out uh, resumes that are identical, but you swap in different names. And based on the perceived race or gender, uh, you get different uh, response rates. And so there's kind of an analogy here that we want to see will uh, common sense models behave differently if we uh, manipulate the names of the people involved in the scenarios. And so um, we can see that based on uh, gender and uh, race or ethnicity, so um, names that are statistically, um, associate, or statistically associated with people who identify as Asian, Hispanic, African American, or European American, um, uh, that the uh, BERT representations um, of those names in context seem to relatively strongly cluster by identity. So that's just our starting point. So we, we know that this information is present in the uh, contextual representation. So what does this mean for the behavior of downstream tasks? What, what happens when we take um, social IQA and fine tune a model on a contextualized representation to perform this task? And so this is our work uh, called SODAPOP, uh, Social Bias Discovery from Answers About People. And what we want to do is, um, in particular, we're interested in trying to automatically uncover stereotypes about groups. So there's been a lot of work in NLP about trying to replicate known social stereotypes in NLP models, but all of this work involves sort of pre-specifying what stereotypes you're looking for. And so this is very useful on the one hand because it's been shown that known, well-studied social stereotypes are replicable in NLP models, but it kind of leaves open the question of what else might be in there? Um, if we don't think to look for a particular stereotype, that doesn't mean that it's not present. So if we take a kind of more open-ended approach, what might we discover? And so we're going to take social IQA examples. So we have the context describing the situation. So a person uh, regarded every person uh, carefully before they decided whom to talk to. Question, how would you describe that person? And so we have you know, three possible uh, multiple choice answers. The correct one is uh, a nervous calculated person, according to the data set. And then we're actually going to get rid of the other distractor answers, and we're going to generate our own distractor answers by taking the correct answer and perturbing it uh, one word at a time using a BERT model. So we're going to generate wrong answers um, that are sort of similar, that are based on the original correct answer, but manipulated one word at a time. 
So our perturbed answers are a cunning, ruthless person, or a, a cunning, ruthless predator, or one funny, intelligent person. And so what we discover is that when we swap in different names with different associated demographic attributes, the model will pick a different answer. So in the, this is a real example. If we swap in the name Aisha, um, which is uh, a, um, commonly an African-American female name, the model predicts A, a cunning, ruthless predator. If we swap in the name Nancy, which is a common European-American female name, the model instead predicts B, one funny, intelligent person. So anecdotally, this seems to suggest that the model um, might be making very uh, biased predictions based on what it perceives the identity of uh, the person to be. Um, so we want to kind of go about studying this in a more systematic, um, statistically robust way. So we're going to generate about 20 million of these instances um, using a bunch of different names and a bunch of different generated um, uh, answers. And we're going to then ask the question, how likely is a particular distractor that we generated, how likely is that, generator, how likely is that distractor to fool the model? And does that depend on what the name is? And in particular, does it depend on what the associated demographics are of that name? Um, so spoilers, um, the answer is yes. We're going to find that it does, in fact, uh, depend um, on the name and demographic information. So to quantify this, we're going to define something called a success rate, which is a function of a word and a name. So the success rate is the probability that the model chooses a distractor over the correct answer, given that word W appears in that distractor, and name N appears in the context. So what's the probability that this word leads to successfully distracting the model when the name is present in the context? And so once we've defined and calculated these success rates for words and names, we can define a success rate vector for a particular name, which is just the success rate for that name with all of the different words in our vocabulary that appear in the generated distractors. And so for every name, we'll have a success rate vector. And we want to know, do these success rate vectors you know, look similar across different names? Does our success rates similar across different names? Um, or are they different? And are they different on the basis of demographic attributes? And so these are TSNE projections of the success rate vectors um, for names associated with different um, racial and gender groups. And we find that there's very strong clustering behavior um, observationally um, among these success rate vectors. So in this uh, plot on the far left, we see that um, these clusters over here on the left, uh, the, the blue X's and the green dots are the uh, uh, European American female names and the European male, American male names, respectively. Um, and on the right side, we have African American female and African American male names. So we have uh, clustering on the basis of gender, and we also have clustering on the basis of race. So within each of these clusters, they're further broken down um, by associated gender. Okay. So that's just kind of observational. Um, the success rate vectors um, cluster strongly according to demographic information. And one thing I'll note is that this is not clustering on the basis of the embedding representation of the BERT model. This is based, this is, these are vectors that are based purely on the behavior, the downstream behavior of the model. So the behavior of the model is clusterable in this way. Um, we want to now also ask uh, not just, you know, if we apply a TSNE projection, can we, can we visualize the clusters, but um, if we actually cluster the original vectors using um, just a basic k-means uh, classification, um, how, how good are those clusters at um, correctly classifying the names based on uh, demographic attributes? And so what we find, so if, if the models were completely unbiased and treated all of the names in exactly the same way, the, we would expect the accuracy to be 50% in these, in these cases. And what we find is that um, in many cases, the, um, 
doing k-means clustering on these success rate vectors leads to very high classification accuracy. So we can recover what the demographic information is based on the success rate vector. Um, and more concerningly, uh, even if we uh, compute success rate vectors using uh, debiased methods, using a model that used um, a debiased um, uh, embedding model, um, we're still getting very, very high classification accuracy. So despite debiasing attempts, um, SodaPop is still capable of detecting what the um, demographic information is um, based on uh, the, the model's behavior, based on the success rate vectors. Um, and only in a very small number of cases does the classification accuracy go down. And even then, it's only by a little bit. Um, OK, so we're showing that the success rate vectors um, mean that the model is behaving differently towards these groups. Um, but qualitatively, what does that look like? Um, what are the words that are fooling the model in a great, to a greater rate for one group over another group? And to, to um, analyze that, we are going to take um, two comparison groups. So in this example, we have a lot more examples in the paper, but just for here, we have um, the comparison of African-American female names versus European-American female names. And what distractors are um, comparatively more likely to fool the model for African-American names, African-American female names versus European-American female names. So we compute this um, uh, relative difference, RD, um, statistic that is basically uh, looking at the mean success rate for the two groups and looking at the differences in means across those two groups. Um, and then also normalizing it by the overall success rate. Um, and so which, uh, which words have the greatest differences between group, group means? Um, for African-American female uh, names, the uh, words with the highest relative success rate um, are overwhelmingly uh, negatively con connotated. Um, and there's this common theme of violence throughout them. Um, for uh, the European-American female names, there's sort of an overwhelming pattern of uh, positive connotation. Um, we also see attributes that are stereotypically feminine and indicate um, a higher social status. Um, so we can see that the models are, uh, the, the kinds of inferences that the models are making um, are different across groups and also different across groups in ways that are harmful and reinforce existing social um, stereotypes. Okay, so to back up just a moment, um, the sort of broad takeaways from this talk are um, you know, going back to this theme of what are the assumptions that models make um, and what are the assumptions that we make about models. Um, first, defeasible reasoning is, offers a framework for um, better context-sensitive reasoning with potentially broad applications across domains. Um, we've seen that partial input baselines should be thought of as kind of a red flag, but not a final verdict on whether or not uh, full input models are performing reasoning. Um, and then in the last part, we saw that uh, generative inference models are overly sensitive to identity and produce stereotyped inferences. And then we showed a way where we could automatically discover what those um, stereotypes are in a social common sense reasoning model um, without pre-specifying which stereotypes we're searching for. Um, so that's all I have. I'm happy to take any questions. That's right, yeah. Um, did you um, do an analysis of this sort of like, name swapping without having the answers for the um, That's a good question. No, we, we didn't look at the um, behavior for the original, um, for the original distractors. Um, that, that's an interesting question, yeah. 
Um, two things. One is kind of simple, but I don't fully understand. So in the uh, is back part two, mm -hmm. the bottom right corner where confidence decreased um, once you had the full uh, the question. Mm -hmm. Is that because those are sort of rare cases? Is there a lexical or, or, or syntactic ambiguity? And uh, like, what's causing that movement? Yeah, um, it's. That's a, that's a really good question. Um, I think it's hard to say, you know, without doing further studies, what's actually causing those examples to become less confident. Um, it could be that, um, you know, that there's some information. So, so clearly the model is uh, leveraging something in the context, but it seems to, in those cases, be something that's l leading the model astray. Um, so I think that, you know, in any situation where the model is going to use additional information, um, sometimes that additional information might help, sometimes that information might lead it astray. The overwhelming majority of cases it's helping, um, but it seems as if you know, it's, it's not possible to um, sort of uh, venture into forms of reasoning that leverage the context without also taking on the risk that maybe you make a false inference, maybe, maybe sometimes it, it leads you astray. Um, as to what specifically those examples look like, I don't have a great answer about um, you know, what specifically might be you know, causing the model to, um, to be led astray in those cases. Yeah, but, but that'd be interesting to analyze. Yeah, one, one more thing I think is related to the definition of reasoning. So I'm curious, like, so I get it in this context where reasoning is sort of uh, an entailment or like a subset relationship type thing. Um, and I know it's a toy example of the math test sort of by comparison. Mm -hmm, sure. But in, in, in that kind of context where the reasoning mechanism is explicit and exact, mm -hmm. um, would we assume that the, the, an ideal model that basically learns how to do math would uh, effectively never look at spurious correlations? Because the mechanism would sort of, it, 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 there wouldn't be a, a reason to, or the, or the barrier, I guess, which is related to the question from earlier, um, before you would look at those correlations, that would be incredibly high. Right, yeah, so I think it has to do with how reliable the evidence is. And so, you know, if, if you're, you know, in the, in the metaphor, the student who is taking the math test, if you're confident in your math abilities, you're not going to say 2 plus 2 is 4, but on the other hand, answer C is 3. So maybe, you know, you're going to um, go with the, the mode of reasoning that um, gives you the strongest evidence. Um, and so in a lot of cases, it's still possible to learn to do reasoning if the better evidence is coming from the reasoning itself um, rather than uh, artifacts. But it's certainly possible for those artifacts to overwhelm. Yeah, I guess I'm thinking that you could imagine an idealized setting that you have this sort of spectrum between sort of increasingly maybe factoid types of reasoning versus more mm -hmm. um, sort of subjective. Yeah. And then, the, and then the, that would correlate with the sort of ability or the robustness of the model under different Yeah, I, I see what you're saying. So, you know, the, maybe, and this, this would be an interesting experiment, um, in cases where there's less of an objectively correct answer, um, and so you're just kind of always relying on soft evidence, um, which is more the case in, in a task like social common sense, um, rather than like something that is you know definitive like factoid question answering or math reasoning, um, that maybe artifacts would hold more sway because everything is just soft evidence. Um, I think that's a really good question, and um, yeah, I, I, I don't know uh, you know empirically what 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 the answer is, but but that could well be the case. Uh, I think I saw your hand first. Yeah. Um, did you see any like effect of like stronger delta or like weaker delta, like variation is in it? Like um, there are like updates that can be stronger than one update um, in positive nature than the other. Like is there a like, correlation of that that would affect that? Yeah, um I, I think in the data there definitely are cases where um the strengthener is a stronger strengthener, and some strengtheners are a little bit more circumstantial or a little bit weaker. Um, we, we haven't done anything to like try to quantify that specifically. Um, it would be interesting to look at model confidences as maybe a way to kind of 
um, separate out or, or as, as a first pass way of trying to identify which are the stronger kinds of um, strengtheners or weakeners versus a little bit um, weaker evidence. Um, yeah, that, that's, that's a really interesting um, uh, idea. And um, yeah, I, I think that that's something that would be worth looking into. Yeah. Uh, in the back, yeah. I'm curious if you investigated any of the strategies that the human annotators use when constructing these strengtheners and weakeners, because you can imagine they might you know, appeal to increased specificity, mm -hmm. but they could also you know, introduce maybe some skepticism about what the, you know, the original context or premise is. Yeah. Yeah, so there there are we did observe some kinds of strategies that, that people seem to use um, that might have led to some of these artifacts. So, you know, in the case of um, social reasoning, uh, you know, there are kind of these general back off strengtheners and weakeners like, but you promised or but they're being mean, those kinds of things um, that might be generally applicable that, you know, because those are easy to think of um, that annotators might also um, tend towards because it's, it sort of lowers the, the effort cost of, of annotating. Um, we also saw in SNLI there were some there was some there was an interesting strategy that some annotators seemed to use um, to uh, apply a weakener, which is you've got a description of a scenario, and then you have some hypothesis, like you know uh, a woman is crossing the street holding the child of a of a holding the hand of a small child. Um, and the hypothesis is, you know, the woman is the child's mother. And the kind of weakeners that some people would sometimes write for those examples are, and then the director yells, cut. Um, something that kind of makes the scenario a, a fake scenario or, or something involving acting or um, kind of puts it in a box and, and makes any sort of, um, that kind of blocks those, those inferences. So we did see some kinds of strategies like that coming up. Uh, I'm gonna just uh, over here. Yeah. yeah. Uh, as a follow-up to, to the other question, um, do you observe that the models are well integrated to the strength, degree of strength, in uh, in, in the defeasible case, and even in, in this slide? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so because we, so we haven't we haven't investigated that in part. Um, we would need um, sort of calibrated labels from humans, but I'm, but I'm actually thinking about it because we, we did, when we performed the validation, we didn't just have humans give a binary label of strengthener or weakener, you know, for the data we collected. We actually asked them to rate them on a scale from one to five. Um, and so we could actually go back and look at whether or not those um, um, ordinal annotations correlate in, in any way with model confidences, um, but we haven't looked at that. That would be really interesting. Yeah. Just, just to sort of, uh, you know, uh, if you have like degree annotation, mm -hmm. uh, do you have like multiple annotators uh, annotating like the strength or weakness of, of an inference? Yeah, we, we did have multiple annotators. Um, I, I don't recall the um, agreements off the top of my head. I think it was like pretty reasonable, but, but yeah, I, I don't have those. Yeah, I don't remember the number. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I have a follow up. So I saw a few slides back. You show the Tisney's result is worse than Kamin's. Is that what that it finds? Um, this is in the last section. Yes. Um, so the, my motivation is this that. This here? So yeah, yeah if a Kamin's, Kamin's is notoriously bad for like mm -hmm. high dimension. So it's kind of suggesting that this model you're doing is kind of doing it well in a lower dimension or in the um so so I mean I think so it, first of all it depends on which pair of groups is being compared. Um, so if we can look at this on the fly, um, if we compare um, let's see uh, European American female and European American male to African American female and African American male. Um, that seems like you'd have relatively high uh, accuracy. Um, um, and then that's comparing 
Yeah, but um, yeah, in, in this case, uh, the um, the clustering uh, based on uh, race has very has pretty high accuracy as well. Um, so, I mean, I think the it's it's not entirely clear which um, method should get higher accuracy, but I think that at least preserving the higher dimensionality um, preserves the possibility of, you know, when, when you project down to two dimensions, um, you might not, uh, uh, you know, preserve all the information that you need to, um, to perform the classification. Yeah, so the, the, it's hard to say, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the other question is, uh, have you looked at the direction of adversarial, like a word perturbation, does that align with the word of choice that you use to perturb the models? Like maybe giving adversarial examples and then try to see the adversarial example whether they overlap with the word of choice that you have used here. Right, right. Um, so the, the perturbations that we used did involve substituting in different names. Um, so in, in, a, in a weak sense, it's sort of adversarial because we're picking words that the language model likes to predict given the context with, with uh, various names involved. Um, uh, so you know, we're, we're, it's adversarial in the sense that the um, perturbed uh, distractor answers have high language model probability. Um, but I'm not sure if that answers your question. Um, my question is, have you looked at the maximization of the loss direction of the I see. Like, yeah, yeah, no, no, we haven't done that experiment, yeah. yeah. Uh, yes? Uh, so going back to your example of like Harold is a bird, Harold can't fly. Sure. Uh, because he's a penguin example in the Diffie's of raising section. Do you ever still think about kind of like prototypicality as a useful frame for like where assumptions in these inferences come from? Um, yeah, I, I think that, um, okay, I guess it's the very first slide. Um, so yeah, I think that prototypicality, I mean, that seems very related to this issue of stereotyping where um, there might be, you know, there's the question of sort of what are the real world statistics? Um, you know, if, if an animal is a bird, um, you know, how likely is it to fly? And that's, you know, is that defined over all instances of birds? Is it defined over um, species of birds? Is it defined over birds that we're likely to talk about or likely to see. Um, you know, there's sort of different ways of defining that, uh, that probability distribution. Um, and so, and prototypicality can also deviate from uh, real world statistics. So, you know, chickens lay eggs, but in point of fact, and, and so, you know, I think most people would say that like prototypically that's true, um, but in point of fact, only 50% of chickens lay eggs. Um, and so, uh, you know, in terms of like formally trying to analyze these examples in terms of um, are they based on some prototypical attributes, we haven't tried to like annotate that or, or do any, you know, analysis up in that direction. Um, but I'm sure that there's, there's an effect there. Yeah. One, there's one last. Otherwise, we might walk over to the social and that people can ask their uh, Rachel more questions in that context. Great, okay, and we'll thank Rachel one more time.